Good morning. morning. Hey, we're glad you're here on this holiday weekend. Um, I'll leave it up to Bob Johnston, one of our worship leaders, whether he's going to invoke you to sing doubly loud for the folks that aren't here today. But yeah, so we're glad you're here, though. Um, We do have a few announcements that we want to um, highlight. Uh, Now, next Sunday, we are planning on starting our Sunday school. We had a good number of people say yes, they'd be willing to stick around for Sunday school. So that would be starting next week. Um, 11.30, I think, is the would probably be the starting time like we did before. Also, just to let you know, the most important thing about church for many, many people we'll have next week, which is coffee. Um, we, will, we will have some coffee beginning again next week. Um, but also, I wanted Becky Alves to come forward. She's our children's ministry director, and she's got a few updates on what to expect as far as child care and children's ministries and such. And it's still, as you can imagine, a little bit of a work in progress because some of our volunteers, um, for a number of different reasons, uh, are, have not come back to the worship uh, service yet. So. We're still a little bit short in some areas of of volunteering, and I'll let Becky talk to you about that. All right, so um, our biggest concern at this point um, is the nursery during the worship service and the children's worship for the little lambs, um, which is the younger kids. And um, I'll just give you a a brief explanation of what the little lambs would entail. It is a one-month commitment every three months. And so you would be taking over and doing the lessons. We have the box full of all the supplies, full of the the stories, full of everything. So you just take the box home, you go through the stories, you prepare what you need. Anything you might need that isn't in the box, we either have here or we can get. So you would just notify me and I would help you get what you need. Um, As far as the nursery, that is not technically a long-term commitment. If you can volunteer once every so often, once every other month, once every three months, Um, Just sign up because without somebody in the nursery, there's no place for the little babies (laughs) who might want to stay there. (laughs) Um, I know some. Yeah, (laughs) and that's okay too. (laughs) But um, if you would, I'm going to have the sign up sheet and I'll be in the back after the service. So anybody who wants to either talk to me some more about it or to sign up, and obviously we don't have to be signed up for the full year because sometimes you don't know what's going to happen at the end of the year. So it, as long as we're like a month out and you see that there's a need and you have the ability, just go ahead and sign up. And most of us um, have already filled out the, um, what am I trying to say? Um, background the background check, thank you. <laughs> and so if you, if you want to volunteer and haven't filled out a background check, let's go ahead and get that taken care of, and then you're covered for the next... I, I believe it's once every year or once every two years? Once a year. Um, so then we're, we're covered for that, and some of us probably need to update that as well. Um, so with those things in mind, I will be in the back. Please come and talk to me, and then um, any offers, suggestions, we can go from there. As for next Sunday, um, I don't have anybody signed up yet, but I'm sure after, now, after today we'll have somebody in the nursery. <laughs> But um, also for the children's worship, the upper level, um, I still need to talk to Cody again, but I won't be here next week, and we're supposed to start, so we'll figure things out for that. Okay. Okay, so there will be children's worship next Sunday, um, and then we'll do the regular program the following week. (laughs) All right? Um, So basically, that's it. So again, I'll be in the back, so don't forget to come and talk to me. Thanks. Yeah, I've talked to a lot of pastors and then business owners and such, and even a church our size, you know, the, the planning is one of the hardest things to do. And so if, you, if it looks like we're planning uh, on the go right in front of you as we speak, that's, that's what we're doing. So, um, and, and just a little plug, I'd encourage you, um, if you're a guy, now when I was in seminary, my wife and I used to volunteer in the nursery at the church that we served at attended as well and um, I remember a, a, a lady she looked at me she, she just was so over the top enthusiastic and she said oh it's so great that we have men serving in the nursery and I didn't think about it I just thought well isn't that what 
you do, you, you help out. And she said, well, you know, a lot of these young kids, they grow up in church thinking church is just for women, and you very rarely see a, a guy volunteering in nursery. So if you're a guy, you're looking for a place to plug in, uh, you wouldn't be in there alone. We'd put you, pair you up with someone else in the nursery, and again, the background checks and such. So we're, again, looking uh, for volunteers, and thanks, Becky, for um, covering some of that. I'll let you look at the rest of the announcements and all the, the COVID guidelines we have in place and doing things a little different the last several months. And again, uh, just in case you're wondering, there is coffee next week. <laughs> and so that might bring some of you back. Let the worship team come. Thank you, Pastor Bob, and good morning, everyone. Good morning, church. Let me just say, as a, uh, as a guy whose babies are all grown up now, I kind of miss my babies. So to all of you families with young ones and babies out there, I love it. I love seeing them, and I love hearing them, too. So, And I think the Lord does as well, right? I think, I think little ones are part of the body of Christ. Amen? Amen. And as far as Pastor Bob saying singing loud, why would you ever not sing loud? We don't mumble, right? Singing is singing. So of course I'm going to encourage you to sing loud. And as I invite you to stand with us, if you're able, um, I just want to share with you this morning something simple and yet profound, and I'll leave it at that, that you have been prayed for this morning as we enter worship this morning where we want to think and focus on the Lord, not only of his existence, of, of his reality, but also his presence, his call upon us in our lives, even this very day, this very minute, right now. Amen? Amen. Amen. So please join us in singing, Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Jesus 
Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast loved us, love us still. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast loved us, loved us still. Amen. Amen. May it be so. Now, give thanks. Make me a servant. 
Before we go to our congregational prayer, I just wanted to read a psalm uh, from Psalm 23. Um, you're all very familiar with that, I'm sure. Um, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you, God, are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Blessed are you, O Lord, the king of this universe. In you we move and live and have our being. We thank you that you are our rock and our refuge, our strength and stronghold, and ever-present in the time of need. We thank you, Lord, that we can cast our anxieties upon you for you care for us. We thank you that we can let all our anxieties be known to you and you will give us your peace when we give thanks and trust in you. And um, perfect peace you give those whose minds are fixed on you, the author and perfecter of our faith. Father, we pray this morning that we live in a very troubled world and um, certainly we may not know what our future holds, but we do know who holds our future. And we rest in that. And that's where our sense of peace comes from, that you have this world in your hands. And that ultimately it all will come down to bring glory to you. And um, so we rest in that, that knowledge and in that truth. We also thank you that you are a warrior and you fight our battles for us. And um, we can trust you and depend upon you. We pray, Father, that you just pour, pour out your spirit even now as we pray and just comfort our hearts and quiet our hearts. Help us to cease striving and know that you are God, the king of this universe in which we move and live and have our being. Uh, just bring that comfort, bring that strength. Move our hearts, Lord, to reach up to you because truly only in you and because of you do we find peace. Father, we pray for um, some people in our congregation. We pray for Kevin. I mean, uh, we pray for um, Doug, and we ask that you be with him as he uh, continually um, gets uh, surgery on his back and uh, just be with the doctors. Give him a sense of conscious awareness of your peace. We also just lift up uh, Al and Annette as Al goes into hospice or is in hospice, and we just pray for just your comfort and um, strength to be with them. And so now we give you thanks for all that you've given us, Lord, and we continue to pray as you've taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We're uh, continuing our series in 1 Peter. We're reading from 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4 this morning. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. And I'll um, read those verses for you, but just to remind you that Peter... There we go. 
that Peter is writing to encourage us to stand firm in what he calls the true grace of God. He's writing to exiles, churches, church members that are scattered throughout Asia, probably small house churches of probably 20 people at the most, perhaps just small, we, we would call them small groups. Um, he refers to them again as, as exiles uh, scattered throughout Asia. Um, and they were going through some amount of suffering and persecution. And he writes, he says, briefly encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. And so everything that he writes, all of the, the teaching, all of the encouragement, all of the, the imperatives, all of that is what he refers to as the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. Then as we go to Second Peter in a few weeks, he talks about, I have written you to help you recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. And so he's, he's writing, to, again, to help us to stand firm by thinking um, pure thoughts, thoughts that are, are based on good teaching and not the false teaching of the false teachers that he goes into some detail in Second Peter. He takes a little bit of a turn here uh, in chapter 5 as he addresses the elders, and we'll talk about the elders. Really, this, this message, I, I thought so much about your elders all week and how thankful I am for, uh, for each of them and how well and uh, faithfully they serve. But follow with me as I read the, these uh, four verses. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder, and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. So the question is, why in this portion of God's word is Peter addressing the elders? And I think the answer can be found if you go back into the immediate context, chapter 4, verse 12 to begin with, and then we'll look at verse 17 and then jump over back to our passage this morning. But chapter 4, verse 12, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. In other words, expect that as a follower of Jesus Christ, you should expect suffering as a Christian. Jesus said to expect it. If they treated me this way, they'll treat you that way. Then down to verse 17. For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. I want to stop there for a brief moment. Uh, most commentators are thinking that this is an allusion either to Malachi chapter 3 and Ezekiel chapter 9, where both Ezekiel and Malachi are talking about the judgment of God's people Israel, but it would begin in the household, that is the temple. And if you especially go back to read Ezekiel chapter 9, it said it started with the elders. And so the idea was that, look, if judgment is going to begin in the household of God, um, how will it be for those who do not obey the gospel? And then if you jump over to chapter 5, verse 1, there's a little word that's missing in the NIV translation. I find quite curious why they admitted it but it's the Greek particle un, often translated therefore. And so if you've ever studied the Bible for a while, they say if you see a therefore, what? Ask what, it's there. Ask what it's there for. And it's usually talking about something that preceded. And so what Peter is doing, he's applying about the judgment that begins in the household of God among the elders, a reference again to Ezekiel chapter 9, Malachi chapter 3. Therefore, to the elders... So are you elders very excited now that the judgment begins with us? <laughs> that is, the purification. 
the trials, the, the hardships, not judgment of our salvation, but, but as you go back to chapter 1 of 1 Peter, it's a pur- purification of our faith. It begins with us. And why does it begin with us? Well, I was following a little bit. I love baseball. I was following some stories. There's a, a little team over in the Chicago area. Actually, there's a couple of teams. And they inherited or got by trade one of the, our Detroit Tigers. So Cameron Maben, sorry if you're not a baseball fan, but Cameron Maben, I, I, we watched Cameron Maben when he was drafted by the Tigers when he was playing for the Whitecaps. Young man coming up and promising player. Um, then he, was, he played for the Tigers for a few years and he was traded away. Then he was traded back to the Tigers just this past summer or, yeah, summer, I'm kind of mixed up with the, the baseball season, but then he was traded to my beloved Cubbies. And so they asked, uh, you know, they were doing some analysis, as baseball people will do, and they said, what do you think the Tigers lose with Cameron Mabin being gone? And they said that, well, we'll lose a leader in the clubhouse. Um, good player, veteran player, he would show uh, rookie players or younger players how to prepare, how to take care of their body, how to play the game, how to respect your opponent. He was a vocal and a, a leader by example in the clubhouse. Now, even though this passage in 1 Peter addresses specifically the leaders, if you are not an elder in the church, I hope that you see that it applies to you also in two different levels. One, that I hope you aspire to some sort of leadership. And leadership is simply um, example, if I can boil it down to some uh, simple things. It's it's setting an example. And you want to set a good example, right? So this would apply to you. Um, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 11, follow me as I follow Christ. Or imitate me as I imitate Christ. When we were kids, we played a game called follow the leader. And it's pretty self-explanatory. You just follow the leader and do what the leader does. So Peter addresses the leaders. Where did Peter get this imagery of a shepherd? Well, Paul read it for us this morning, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. We could stop there, and there's just so many things we could talk about, and we are going to stop there for a moment. But let me just suggest, everybody here this morning needs a shepherd. I hope none of us here are so disillusioned or or fooled to think that we are strong enough, wise enough, capable enough to shepherd our own lives through this chaotic world we need someone above and beyond us and also walking alongside of us to shepherd us the lord is our shepherd we lack nothing he makes me lie down in green pastures he leads me beside quiet waters and you can read the rest of the psalm but i love the verse six surely your goodness and love will follow me I like the translation better, will chase hard after me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So certainly Peter's thinking of that passage when he addresses the elders as shepherds, but also I think he has in mind John chapter 21. You remember the passage. Peter is being reinstated after his denials, And Jesus humbles himself again, yet again, cooks. I mean, can you imagine the resurrected Lord of glory cooking breakfast for his disciples on his Coleman stove? Probably didn't have a Coleman stove, but but when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, what? Feed my lambs. And again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. 
The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. So Peter says to the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's suffering, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but basically when Peter is writing to the elders, plural, I'm an elder at this church. I'm one of the elders. I have the privilege of being perhaps what would be called the main teaching elder. But all these men that you see, and many of them serving communion this morning, I am no more of an elder in God's eyes in this church than they are. So he's addressing all of us. And I I think it's fascinating, Peter how he references this idea of God being our shepherd. If you go back to chapter 2, the last verse of chapter 2 of 1 Peter, for you were like sheep going astray. That is all of us here. All of us were like sheep going astray. But now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. And the point I just wanted to make as you look at your outline is that, and men, this, the fellow elders here with me this morning, this should help you feel a little better, (laughs) that Jesus is the shepherd and overseer of our souls. He's the great shepherd of the sheep. If you go back to John 10, he said, I am the good shepherd. My sheep follow me, they know my voice. So, We serve, it's incredible to think about this, but we serve under the great shepherd of the sheep, the the overseer of our souls. Jesus really is the senior pastor of this church. And the rest of us here are under shepherds. He's the shepherd and overseer of our souls. Look at Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. And another point I just want to make before we get into the outline that, 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 that kind of details... What kind of leaders we all need in the local church? And the point is that churches belong to God. Sometimes, and we know what we mean by this, but you know, pastors will get along around each other and we'll talk and we say, how is your church doing? And you know, we, we're not arrogant enough, at least I would hope that we're not, to think that, yeah, this is our church. We own this church. It's just kind of perhaps some lazy speech, but we know that this church belongs to God. You look at verse 2. Be shepherds of Bob's flock. Is that what it says? No. (laughs) It says be shepherds of whose flock? God's flock. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Paul, as he is getting ready to leave the Ephesian elders and the church, perhaps for the last time, Acts 20, verse 28, he says, Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. If that doesn't raise your self-esteem somewhat, (laughs) I don't like that term so much, self-esteem. I'd rather term it something else. But your your, your esteem shouldn't be built on self. But what I'm trying to say here is that you must be worth something if our Savior purchased you with his own blood. I have a friend that getting ready to buy a, a new car next week. So I've been helping him shop for it. It's a 2017 Honda Civic. Really nice car. It's black. Four tires. Steering wheel. All that stuff. And he's going to pay for it. And so it'll be his. Right? Because he purchased it. And he'll take care of it. Because it's his. 
And the point, the simple point I'm trying to make here is that you belong to God. We're living in scary times, perhaps. But, I mean, at least we know some people who are scared. None of us here, right? We're, we're all so assured of ourselves and assured of life. And, but you don't belong to yourself if you're a follower of Jesus. And that's incredibly good news that he bought you and he will take care of you. And so we need to, to, as we look at this passage of what kind of leaders God looks for, especially the elders that I perhaps might be addressing more this morning, but all of you, maybe you shepherd your, your family, you shepherd some neighbors, I don't know, but you're not ultimately in control, the Lord is. And that's good news. So let's look at the kind of leaders that a church needs. And the reason why Paul outlines this is because, look, persecution is coming, hardships are coming, and guess who they're coming after first? They usually, especially read the book of Acts, they come after the leaders. And so what Peter is getting at here is, look, you need to be a leader in the clubhouse. And so when the other players look at you and watch your life, they're going to be able to watch you stand firm. And they need, they need to see you stand firm as an example of following Jesus and as an example of Jesus himself. So first of all, we need church leaders who humbly embrace, and again, I'm calling it the J-curve. It's, it's a term that some writers have used to describe the Jesus curve. But again, you make the J, so you go down, and then you go back up. The vast majority of that J is, is upward trajectory. But the J curve is that there, there, there's two different distinct portions of the life of Christ that theologians talk about. One is humiliation. That involves his incarnation. He humbled himself. Crucifixion, his burial, you're going down, 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 and then third day, <laughs> he rose. You see the J? You're noticing what I'm doing, right? Okay, that's the J curve. Not sure if I'm doing that backwards or not, but it's the J curve. And churches need leaders who humbly embrace the J curve. Now, why do I say humbly? Well, first of all, Peter, there are some traditions that like to elevate Peter to the first bishop of Rome. Peter says, look, to the elders among you, I appeal not as the, the chief potentate elder, but he says, I appeal to you as what? Fellow elder. I'm a fellow elder. And Peter talks more about humbling yourselves. All of you humble yourselves, and, and, and especially in verse 5, as we'll see next week. But why do I again say humble leaders who embrace the J-curve. Well, we've talked about this week after week, but, and, I, and I hope you don't get tired of, of reviewing Peter's life. But you remember Jesus repeatedly tried to tell his disciples, look, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, and I'm going to get killed, and I'm going to be buried. And he was very clear, he said, I'm going to raise, rise again on the third day. But it seemed like the only thing the, the disciples heard, perhaps especially Peter, and I love it when it's just so humorous in a way, Peter took Jesus aside and rebuked him. <laughs> Can you see Peter rebuking the second person of the Trinity, Jesus our Lord, and, and he says, Lord, it will never be, you, you're never going to die. And, the, and Jesus said, get behind me, Satan, you have in mind the things of man, not the things of God. But if you go back to Luke chapter 24, we might pick on Peter a little bit, maybe unfairly. But this is the story of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. This was post-resurrection, but they still did not know if Jesus was alive or not. Most of them still thought he was dead. They were depressed, they were down, they were discouraged. Verse 21, they had hoped and these are the two disciples again. You remember the story, they were talking to Jesus. They didn't know it was Jesus. 
And Jesus said, what's wrong? And he started telling them all the things about the crucifixion. And, but we had hoped that he, that is Jesus, was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of the women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning and they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of the companions went to the tomb. They found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. And here's what Jesus has to say. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? Do you see the two parts of the J-curve there? He had to suffer these things and then enter into his glory. Peter remembered that story, and he's addressing the elders here to humbly embrace the J-curve. Look at verse 1. To the elders among you I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings who will also share in what? The glory to be revealed. The church needs to look at the elders as men who are not giving up when the suffering, the persecution, the hardship comes because they're saying this is part of it. This is part of what it means to follow Jesus. But then they're also modeling the hope of glory. If you look at verse 4, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of what? The crown of glory that will never fade away. I hope that when you all look at the elders, you see men who suffer well. They have to if they're serving with me. They have to suffer a lot of things, right? Well, churches need leaders who will humbly embrace the J-curve. There's so much more we can talk about that, but I want to move on. Second, churches need leaders who serve with proper motives. Look at verses 2 through 3. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And so the proper motives are, are, are threefold. There's an eager willingness. They're not greedy for financial gain. And they're not ego-driven. And we're going to look at all three of those in just a little bit of detail here. But first of all, there, there's an eager willingness to serve, not under compulsion. Now, every year when we start considering around the um, uh, annual meeting the need to perhaps select new elders, we, talk, we, we often go over this passage and and, and we're reluctant to ask anyone or to serve or to put their names forward as an elder if they respond in some way or another, yeah, I guess I'll serve. <laughs> and I, you know, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but it's like, well, I guess if no one else is going to serve, I guess I'll serve as an elder. Peter is wanting to discourage that because the motivation needs to be deeper than that. One writer said that it is the leaders who would suffer first. So it is dangerous to be a leader when the church is under persecution. These churches were about to go through a very fiery trial. And it is understandable that the elder shepherds might look for another job. <laughs> There's an eager willingness. Second, they're not greedy. Peter says this, that you serve not because you must, but because you're willing as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain. 
Now, I was talking to a friend earlier this week, and it was quite interesting. They were of the opinion, and, and I'm not making any kind of proposal here, but I thought it was, it was quite biblical. They said, you know, I think it would be a good thing for our elders to receive a financial stipend. I thought, hmm, that's not a bad idea. Then they could take me out to lunch and other things. I'm just kidding. But, but when you read, especially First and Second Timothy, you see some of that. The, the elders um, were financially compensated. But Peter is saying here, look, don't serve because you're after dishonest gain. But in, in other words, there's, there's always been a thing in religious circles, and you see it today, where there's this, there's this appeal about religious and spiritual things that less than scrupulous leaders will know that they can leverage that to get money from people. You've seen that, right? You've seen that on perhaps tele-evangelists. It's, it's as old as the New Testament. It's old as the Old Testament, really, Balaam. Remember Balaam? But uh, there's this one example. I think it's in Acts chapter 8. Let me read that for you if you have your Bibles. Uh, Acts chapter 8. So you remember Simon, um, the sorcerer? Simon? So there's a term that was named after him. It's called simony. And that's when um, you know, leaders try to um, uh, leverage getting power and, and position in the church by paying a certain amount of money. And it happened in Acts chapter 8. There was a man named Simon. He would practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great. Then he saw the apostles laying hands on some of the people and healing them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit in verse 16. I mean, verse 18, Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands. He offered them what? Money. And he said, give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. And who answered him, by the way? Peter. <laughs> Peter answered, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. And Peter's trying to warn the elders of the scattered church, don't be greedy for money or try to leverage your way into the church positions of leadership with your money. Not greedy. Don't pay for influence in the church, and so much more we could talk about that, but let me just assure you that um, I look out at our men that have served over the years as elders in this church. They have put in countless hours and heart into this ministry, and do you know how much they've been paid? So I just mention that because I don't think we have greedy elders here. The person who suggested to me that perhaps it'd be a good thing for the elders to receive a stipend is not an elder. <laughs> they, they didn't bring that up. So you have an eager willingness to serve. What an awesome thing to be called an, an under-shepherd or to be assigned to be an under-shepherd in God's church. It's scary sometimes when you think about it. And I think this is one way that, that Peter is sort of talking about the same things that James talked about. He said, not many of you should presume to be teachers. And why? He said, because teachers will face the stricter judgment. I'm aware of that every time I get up to preach or teach. It's like, okay, in this wonderful I'm opening up myself to greater judgment. <laughs> eager willingness, not greedy, but also not ego-driven. Again, look at verse 3. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. I remember when I had the privilege of finally earning my, my doctorate I remember someone said to me, so what do we call you now? Bob? <laughs> Bob? 
But is it reverend first or doctor first? Reverend doctor or doctor reverend? I just, just feel so creepy about that. And that's just me. I'm not saying others are more comfortable with that. that that's fine, but not ego. You know, this idea of lording it over that I love authority. I love being in charge. I love people looking up to me. Peter said, look, if you're ego-driven, if it's all about you when persecution comes, you're out of here. Go back to John 10. The hireling will not stay and protect the sheep because they, you know, they don't care for the sheep. They basically just care about themselves. And Peter's saying, don't, don't lord it over those entrusted to you, but be a leader in the clubhouse. Be an example to the flock. So we've looked at the idea that churches need leaders who humbly embrace the J-curve. They need leaders who serve with proper motives. And last of all, churches need leaders who hunger for God's glory. And if you look at this idea of, of you'll also share in the glory to be revealed. And so I don't know if perhaps, I don't know if there's an order of, of, of the enjoyment of the glory of God or an ability to enjoy the glory of God more than others, and I'll talk about that in a moment, but if the judgment's coming, first of all, to the household of God and the leaders are singled out, the leaders are also singled out, I think, for this idea of, of receiving this crown of glory. What a beautiful thing. You say, well, that's not why I serve. I don't serve to receive um, rewards. Well, I don't have any problem with that. I mean, Jesus promised those rewards, so it must be a, a proper motivation. But churches need leaders who will hunger for God's glory. Again, I was watching that more superior baseball team, Detroit, than the other teams that we could follow. I'm just joking, but they asked this, this one individual player, so, so what's your individual goals for this season? He said, well, I want to make the playoffs, but then he stopped and paused, but it doesn't, he said, it doesn't matter what I, it's really a team goal. In other words, I'm not after individual stats. I'm not after my own glory. I'm looking out for the glory of, of the team. And that's somewhat, I think, what Peter is calling the church leaders to embrace. They, this is what you need, by the way, uh, the flock of God here at Crossway. You, you need leaders who are not ego-driven or after greedy gain or they're just serving because, oh, no one else will serve. But you need leaders whose greatest hunger is for the glory of God. And uh, there's so much that we could say about this, but I, I left some verses where Peter's already talking about the glory of God in chapter 1, chapter 4. But let me read to you just a few verses from Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. Now there's somewhat uh, much ink has been spilled about what do these crowns signify. We have this one song, right? Crown him with many crowns. And so if you go to Revelation chapter 4, there's this throne in heaven and there's elders around this throne. The 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and they worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and they say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. And I, I think, this is a little bit of conjecture, but I, I, I think it's very plausible, is that when elders, and, and there's other crowns that are mentioned in the Bible, we, we receive our crowns as rewards. And I think one thing, at least, that the crowns represent is our capacity to worship Jesus when we meet him face to face. 
I don't think all of us are going to have the, the same equal capacity to worship him with, as, as, you know, it's not going to be, an, an, we're going to grow throughout of e- eternity in our ability to worship him. It's not going to be just like, well, I've been kind of just tiptoeing through the tulips, putting my toe in and in the water, not jumping full in. And, but, but someday when I meet him in glory, I'm just going to be all in. You will be. Maybe after 10,000 years, you know, the, the psalm says. But there's going to be some because they've served with such faithfulness and a desire for the glory of God. The moment they meet him, they're just, they have this capacity to just to throw down their crowns, this, this ability to worship him in fullness. Now, I'm not going to go to the wall for that interpretation on what the crowns mean, but it's a little bit of what I see. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15, the prophet says, I will give you shepherds, talking to Israel, I will give you shepherds after my own heart, who will lead you with knowledge and understanding. Those are the kind of leaders that the local church needs because when the time comes, you're going to need some leaders in the clubhouse. And that's why Peter is specifically addressing the elders before he goes on to the rest of the church. So finally, if you're following in your outline, to serve well, to serve well, pastors and elders must trust the good shepherd. Because Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame, and he served with the most pure of motives, always doing the Father's will. He was willing to be humiliated so the Father could be glorified. He was not ego-driven, lording it over us. Just think about that. The Lord of glory was not ego-driven, lording it over us. Instead, he came to his creation as a servant to lay down his life for the sheep. So pray that your under-shepherds would experience their great shepherd in this way. Because as they do, they are loved and will experience Jesus. They will have his life flowing into them, through them, and to the flock. As they respond to the gospel in obedience, much like Peter, by caring for his sheep. We're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper at this time. And if I can have um, the elders come forward, at least the, the men who served last, last month, the same guys, I think you know who you are.
the sanctuary but just again these these verses think of these as we partake of the elements Jesus said the thief comes only to steal kill and destroy and we have a thief that has been doing that our, our whole entire lives he doesn't want us to be fully alive by having a relationship with our creator but Jesus says I have come that they may have life and have it to the full I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. You're able to stand for the benediction. By the way, if there's anyone here this morning that you've heard some language about knowing Jesus, you've heard language about the gospel, you're not quite sure what all that means and how that applies to you, please come talk to me uh, or one of the elders. We'd be glad. Um, uh, to point you to the Good Shepherd. So may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant, brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And God's people said, Amen. Amen.